Our next talk will be um, offered by the head of fraud and data division at the GRSC, uh, and he will help us make sense of the chaos of data. I welcome to the stage Steve Bradbury. Find a route. Sorry, guys. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Good morning. First pop quiz. How many data scientists have we got in the room? One, two, three. Oh, cool. Not too many. I can get away with this. So, um, brief bio on to me. Uh, my name is Steve Bradbury. I'm the head of fraud and data division for uh, GOSC. Um, I've spent over 25 years in data. I know I don't look a day over 21. I've had fraud experience since uh, back in the 90s. 1992, I got on there. Um, I've spent 12 years with American Express, five years with Thomas Cook, five years with HSBC, and I've been consulting for, again, the last five or so years. Been around the block, um, had a couple of great achievements. I rolled out the first of its kind customer crisis recovery program in American Express back in the time of the Asian tsunami. I redesigned their entire AML and uh, money laundering reporting. Um, you know, you can, you can read for yourself a few, a few cool things. I've only got 30 minutes, I think it's 26 now. I'm going to briefly go over what I do with data, how I approach each different data issue. So it covers off four stages. First thing is always discovery. Second thing is understanding it. And the third thing is evolving it. And I've thrown a few, uh, a few little data stats at the back end of it, just so you, know, you guys have got something nice to take off with you. So first part of any data project I deal with, I've dealt with everything from you know, a company that, that has no fraud, um, has a lot of data, then we open up the data and realize they've got a lot of fraud. All the way to you know, some very, very organized banks and financial institutions that um, have some great fraud models in. And they hire a lot of young staff, so a lot of data scientists and data evangelists and lots of other cool titles. Um, but they don't have you know, that in-depth experience that I think is, is pretty, you know, pretty vital in dealing with fraud issues. So first thing I do with any data problem Look at what we've got. Understand from the business, what is the problem? What, what are your goals here? What are you trying to answer? There is always a business objective. Obviously, in the fraud space, it's let's not lose so much money. All the way through in, you know, in retail, it could be let's drive sales or, or whatever it may be. So first thing is, look at what you've got. What is the data you've currently got available? Have you got everything you need? Can you enrich it? What's your technology? Uh, I previously worked for an Oracle house where you know, everything we did had to be Oracle. Um, and you know, previously done some work with uh, other, other providers. But if you're tied somewhere, it's not always the best solution. So think out the box. You know, there's, there's loads of different platforms available. And what do we know about the data? Again, I think you know, being a getting on a bit man, data knowledge for me is, is key. You know, if you understand what you're looking at, it's easier to talk to the business and, you know, and easier to solve those problems. So my, my very brief case study, um, I was working for a consultancy company and one of the largest travel agents in the Netherlands went bust overnight, just went bang. Straight into administration. Um, there was some, let's say, insider dodginess. They were claiming they have no assets. Anyone that knows anything about travel knows, you know, these guys book their hotels and they book planes and so forth, you know, a lot in advance. It was a family-run business. So I was presented with 26 complete PC dumps, which came to uh, just over 3.2 terabytes of data and 14 filing cabinets. That, that was my data to start with. So, first thing I did, map out my data, see what I've got. It turns out I've got most of those 32, you know, most of those PCs, I've got their entire personal photo collection, <laughs> some which I couldn't share in this presentation. I've got their music collection. Um, I've got their internet search history. Again, some I wouldn't share in this. So, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of clutter, a lot of noise. So first thing I'll do is I'll map it out and I'll clear out the junk, get rid of it. We also have, um, yeah, well, there you go, my total, my total of personal data from my 3.2 terabytes, 1.7 is crap. So instantly I've made my big data project a smaller big data project. So we've got two and a half, day, two and a half terabytes, but we've still got all our filing cabinets. So the next thing I'll do is all my electric files, again, people password, you know, protect a lot of stuff, I'll crack it, 
A lot of companies out there you know, now do that for you. And I'll OCR what I can. So again, I'll take my electronic data, I'll converge, I'll take all my paper data, and I'll use optimal character recognition to make it electronic. Again, obviously we've got to filter through the filing cabinet and remove, yeah, remove the junk. So, working closely with the administrators in this case, I, I increased my knowledge of, of the, the travel industry. I made sure I knew as much as I could about the data once we've cleared out the, you know, the rubbish. So, next thing is understanding it. So, once we've got a better knowledge of the problem, in this case we're trying to find where all the money's gone, we can start searching the data using keywords, you know, applying business rules, standard thing for our, our scientists in the room. And, we, you know, we're, we're making sure that we've, we've got everything we can. Then we're going to create cases that will then, you know, fire us any alerts when anything else is inject, ingested that has, you know, relevance to us, i.e. money. Next thing I'll do is I'll create simple visualizations. There are hundreds of platforms out there that do this. Um, I prefer this one because it's mine. I'm not, I'm not a salesman, but you know, it's a little pitch. So I'm going to then going to visualize my data, which is going to, you know, rather than producing 12 to million Excel sheets, it's going to give our administrators clear guidance on where the cash has gone. The result of this, I'm talking way too fast, the result of this, that travel agent still trades today. They came back out of administration. Uh, the family that run it aren't running it anymore, but it's removed from administration, all the debts were settled, and they still trade today. Uh, any, any people here from the Netherlands, you probably use them. I won't, won't mention the name. But it's all about presenting the data back to the client in a simple and understandable form. That's how I deal with any of these projects. So I'm going to go back into my little passion a little bit. That's, that's my little case study. Go into the dark web, deep web. How many people use go into the dark or deep web at the moment? Anybody? One at the back? One. What does everyone say about the dark web? It's a big scary place. You can't go there. It's wrong. It's really not. Every business that we're talking to when we're looking at the fraud space has this conception that the dark web is a big scary place that we can't go near because, you know, somebody nasty will turn up and hurt us. It's massive. It's so much bigger than the, you know, the, the google.com or, you know, the, the .com and code UK sites. It's, it's true you can buy just about anything from there and um, from a fraud space. I go on the dark web regularly and send to my clients the cards, the bank cards that are currently for sale on there. If you've got just four bitcoins, you can buy a UK bank full sign on details with a guaranteed balance of 80 to 100,000 pounds in it. You're going to be looking at that when you go on the dark web next, aren't you? <laughs> Have you already got it? You put it there, okay, fair enough. People on the dark web, yeah, they're, they're making a lot of money out of bad things. It's really not that difficult. Um, come and talk to me and I'll, I'll tell you in you know, five, ten minutes how I go onto the dark web in a guaranteed safe environment. I know when I'm on there, I'm untraceable, um, I'm protected. But even so, you know, some of the stuff that I look for on there, yeah, they still try and ping me out and get me in trouble, but they don't. So, 95% of the deep web is pub publicly accessible. You can do it, but you can't do it through Google. And uh, if you want some dodgy bank sites, don't Bloke at the back, we'll sort you out. So, moving on to social. My other big passion is data enrichment. So when we're talking to banks, financial institutes, or retail, whoever it may be, I hear time and time again, we don't really do much with social. Fact is, only 5% of people that are scammed will tell their bank, because they don't want to look stupid. They'll moan about it on Twitter and Facebook, but they won't phone up their bank and say, I've just given my password to someone. They've emptied my account. So, 95% of scams go unreported. It's the same with fraud cases. If you get your card skimmed at an ATM, again, come and see me. I've got some great pictures of skimmers. A lot of time, people just write it off, and you know, they won't do anything about it. Look at how that data is growing exponentially. Facebook in the UK, 39 million plus users. Scary thing, 65 million people. 60, 60 million plus are on the internet. You know, I've got young kids. they both got tablets. You know, my daughter's got a phone. That's nice and cheap. 20 million users on, on Twitter. Um, again, anybody, you know, raise your hand if you're not on one of these social profiles. Anybody? Perfect. Great room. We've hit 100%. Ian at the back. 
Remember your password? <laughs> so, how I see the future. Every data set we're bringing in will have social enrichment attached to it. If you're doing it from a fraud investigator's point of view, you know, if I'm trying to track down a bad guy and they say they've got no money, I'm going to look at your Facebook if you, you know, most people leave it open. 70% of Facebook profiles are open. Mine's not, you can't find me. But it's all going to be enrichment. You know, if I think you're a bad guy and I do a bit of social analysis, I'll pull in you know, open corporate data, I'll enhance it with social media. If you've you know, you posted a picture of a Ferrari on your drive and you're a dustman, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask questions. So for me, data enrichment is a passion. Social data is growing year on year. I guarantee every, well, as you say, every, every single one of you guys is on social. I'd be willing to bet that 95% of them, that your phones are still connected right now. Who's put them on silent? See a few of you. What do you do if it rings? So embarrassing. Moving on. So, as I said earlier, five percent of scams are reported. Seventy-five percent will go on social and say, "I've been robbed. I've lost money." So, social media is a key. Again, there's a shed load of, of tools and toys out there that are, you know, promoting social media analytics. A lot of them won't actually let you get hold of the data. For me, it's a key. If you want to enrich your data, sometimes you just want to download it. You know, you want to go old school. So, I've spoken very quickly, but hey, you get some time back. So, please do come and say hello to us. I say, I'm, I'm very, very passionate about fraud. Um, I have made all of my team never want to use an ATM again. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to pop this question. Ian, have you used an ATM since we started working together? No, there you go. So, come and talk to us. Come and talk to us about our data platform. Talk to me about fraud. I love it. I can talk for hours on fraud. Um, and I promise... I'll try and make it so you will use an ATM. So we're also big in the analytics space, AML, KYC, social media, the dark web. Happy to talk about that. Recommend you see that guy at the back in the, uh, in the blue shirt for some dodgy accounts. And we do compliance. I'm also back here at three where I'm talking through um, the largest credit card fraud case in Europe. Uh, I got some bad people sent down for a combined total of 16 years, um, which at the time, is, is, you know, that was the longest sentence ever for a fraud case. So, yeah, do come in for that because, yeah, I love talking about fraud. Give you a bit of time back, but I'll welcome up. Throw me some questions. And is it, can I get some dodgy accounts? No. Shoot. Hi there. So, um, when you're in the um, discover and understanding phases of the data, you know, mm -hmm. clearly a lot of that data is unstructured, maybe on physical you know, files, as you mentioned. Yep. Um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about how you start managing the relationships between uh, unstructured data and the structured data, maybe doing semantic processing or natural language processing to try and understand and stitch the relevant kind of constituent parts together. Yeah, sure. So um, <laughs> exactly as you say. So with unstructured, again, you know, a large, a large part of our data now is unstructured. When I go back to our travel agency, you know, I had all their emails, which is, of course, unstructured. So we'll use, we'll use um, in our platform, we have um, AI built into our entity extraction. Um, we can also, you know, we can customize that so to look out for keywords. You know, for in this case, we're looking for stuff like, you know, hotel or plane or whatever it may be. But it's, again, that's where I think the knowledge of the data is key. So you know the sort of, you know, the, the key parts of the data you're looking for. Um, there's, a few, there's a few solutions I've worked with. Uh, one of them is, a, is an actual language processing engine. But um, again, if you, you know, pop around and see us, on, on our OCR, it's customizable, but it's also very, very smart. Um, when I'm using it in a fraud case, uh, a demo I did, I threw a document in. It was just you know, an unstructured letter from somebody moaning I've been a victim of fraud. Uh, it will automatically look out for, for names, um, and in this case, account numbers. So any data you've put in, it can, you know, it, it, you know, I guess in an AI sort of angle, it will then any fields it's already seen, it will then extract that from it. But 100%, I mean, you know, some of, some of the, the unstructured data can be an absolute nightmare. But yeah, that, that's how we go around it. Chip? Um, just to be picky. Um, oh, God. Right near the start, you said there were 3.2 terabytes or thereabouts and yep. said that you extracted 1.7 and that left 2.5. Now, that's 4.2, is it not? It's a good point. 
So was it 1.7 that you extracted and left with 1.5, or was it 0.7 that you extracted and left with? Uh, I'm just trying to get an idea as to how much it was actually personal. About half was crap. So it was, what? Sorry, 1.7 what, taken out, 1.5 left. Cool. Yeah, that, that's why I'm an ex -date chief data scientist, not a current one, because I can't count. Makes sense. Fair enough. Cheers. Yeah. That does explain a lot, actually, doesn't it? Uh, which way are you going? I've got a few hands. Where? Uh, where, where, I'll take your pick. Uh, when you were talking about data enrichment, uh, mm. where are some of the sources that you get the data to enrich with that, is, that, is, that isn't pre-aggregated? Uh, well, obviously we know social, that's one. Um, so, uh, when, you say you, sorry, when you say you know social, where do you, do you crawl the websites or do you have a source that you're getting that line-by-line -line social data from? Both of. Okay. So yeah, um, we'll, we'll do some web crawling, web scraping. Um, also, again, over my, over my checkered past, um, I've built a list of 8,800 odd open data sources. So stuff like, you know, Companies House, obviously, we can, we can search that for free. So if there's a need for that, we'll build that API into the platform. So, you know, whenever da any data is loaded, obviously, it'll find a name and, and ping out and, and try and find it. So, yeah, it, it's, again, you know, it's a big old list. Um, don't know if I'll share that one, but, yeah, it, it's having that data knowledge and, and over years building up all those sources. I'm dreading this question. Sorry, it's not, it shouldn't be too bad. Um, uh, under GDPR, you're going to require a legal basis for processing uh, in order to do profiling and, and things like that. I was wondering what your plan was with regards to that, particularly with regards to uh, ingesting and enriching data from uh, you know, social sources and all that sort of thing. Yeah, very good point. Uh, GDPR is another one of our, our buzzwords at the moment. Um, I think there's a presentation just there, on it? So yeah, um, with, the, with the financial institutions we're working with, um, we, we follow their protocols. Obviously, you know, we know the right to be forgotten. In certain aspects, that can, that can be sideswiped. Um, in, the case of, you know, in the case of fraud, if we look at um, a, a UK body, CIFAS, which is the, the central governing non-profit non organisation where all bad guys are reported to. So they will be excluded from GDPR because you know, they're bad guys. You know, we don't, want to, we don't want to give them the right to you know, be forgotten, and then they come back and hit us again. So there's certain angles where GDPR won't apply, but yeah, we, we, we make sure we follow strictly with the bank's guidelines, because a lot of them interpret it slightly differently. Same as defaults on mortgages. You know, again, they don't want, to, don't want to forget that too quick if they've cut 100 grand in the hole. Great for fraudsters, though. Any more for any more? Oh, hang on, there's a, just there, please. Oh, sorry. I don't ask him, don't ask a bloke at the back, he's my mate, he's just going to be awkward. Hello Steve, let's be awkward. Um, <laughs> I, was wondering I had a bacon talk, sandwich. I was wondering if you could talk us through some of the scenarios that you've found uh, which is more specifically internal fraud rather than external. Cool. Um, yeah, so back in the, uh, back in the Amex days, um, this is when I think data enrichment is, is again key. So we have a lot of, obviously Amex have a lot of, of call centres. Um, in this case, there was some, some very unusual transactions happening where um, a customer would suddenly find that currency had been ordered on their account, but they, you know, they, they hadn't ordered it themselves. What the bad guys would do, you phone up to change your address, um, the, the internal collusive guy would then temporarily change your address to an address of one of his mates. He'd then order a bucket load of foreign exchange, or traveler's checks back, back then. Um, as soon as that order's been processed, he would change your address to the correct address. And what they'd have is, the following day, when the courier turned up, there'd be a bloke outside working on his car. Oh, you're looking for Mr. Steve? Yeah, yeah, oh, I'll sign for that. So, I, I found that one, caught him, had him prosecuted, and did some time, thank you. Six months later, Amex had employed his sister, who did exactly the same thing. <laughs> exactly the same thing. Down, down to the, you know, every finite data was identical. That's why data enrichment is, is key. Obviously, you can't, you can't be seen to be you know, prejudiced against the whole family because they're not all dodgy, but surely a little alert flag somewhere would have been an idea. Thanks, Paul. Good question. Cool, we're good. Excellent. Thank you for your time. Um, please do go back to see me again at 3 o'clock. Um, see you later. Thank you. <laughs>